Okay, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Tom Cumberlege, I work for the Carlton Trust. Uh, and uh, I've been asked to give a, a bit of a talk around uh, what type of actions companies are taking to drive sustainability across the food and drink value chain. Um, for those of you who don't know the Carlton Trust, quick uh, introduction. Uh, we're set up in 2001. We're an independent company uh, working with businesses, with public sector, uh, and with governments around the world. Um, we tend to categorize our uh, services in three broad themes. Firstly, we provide advice, strategic, strategic advice to businesses, public sector, and uh, governments. We provide footprinting, footprinting of uh, the carbon and water and waste impacts of organizations, of products, of services, of business models. And also we have a, an independent certification company. So we will certify uh, the claims, uh, the footprints of organizations and their products um, as well to international standards. And the last area is around technology. So we, we both help uh, businesses to implement uh, technological solutions and finance those solutions as well. Um, and uh, we also do a lot of work um, in technology innovation, uh, working with governments around the world to try and bring down the cost of uh, renewables and uh, carbon saving technology. So that's the carbon trust. So as I said, I'm going to be talking around the um, uh, value chain in the food and drink sector. Um, and really, I think the first most important place to start is measurement. It's really key. Uh, it's all sustainability activities built on good uh, measurement. So for, for many companies across the uh, food and drink sector, you can see the value chain here starting from supply chain operations uh, to customers. Um, and um, most companies will start where they have ownership of their assets, so their own directed assets, their factories, their vehicles that they use. And they'll start by measuring uh, the carbon impact there, the water impact and the waste as well. And then they might go on to then optimize the processes at those sites that they own because there's immediate bottom line saving to them um, from using less energy, from using less resources. Um, and they then move forward to, to more innovative um, technology solutions. Um, so that's the usual step where they, they start by looking at what they measure and manage first off. And then beyond that, they'll look at uh, their supply chain to understand well, what's what the embodied impact, carbon and water, of all the raw ingredients that they're buying uh, to create their products. So it's a food and drink uh, production company you might be looking at the raw, raw ingredients uh, from agricultural products upstream of the organization. But also downstream, are those products chilled through the value chain, through retail? Um, what type of packaging do they use? Is it recyclable and so on? So there's, a, there's also a view across the value chain. It's that, that entire value chain perspective that's important because it enables the company to really focus in on what's the most material impact, whether it's in their direct operations, their supply chain, or further down with customers. And then enables them to then, at a later stage, to look at uh, supply chain engagement um, and uh, engaging with customers as well. So, one of the examples I've got for you here is, is, a, is, a, a, food, is a frozen food company called Appetito, um, based in, in the southwest of the UK. Um, they, they, did, they took this first step, so they, they, they looked at their own operations. Um, they have an energy bill of uh, one million pounds, uh, a carbon footprint of approximately 8,000 tons of CO2. Uh, and the first step they took really was to, to measure where is the energy being consumed in their factories. So this is, they conducted a, an audit uh, where they had a chartered engineer come to site to be able to understand uh, how the site is performing. They took metered data over a period of time to, to understand where that, where that is energy is being used across all the different equipment. Um, and then look at a whole range of, of projects that can effectively reduce the wastage. So these are typical uh, projects with, with a less than a, a, a four year payback in many cases. Um, and combined, um, as a result of this survey that they undertook, there's total savings potential of, of £205,000 uh, with a 3.3 year payback. Uh, that will reduce their carbon emissions by 18%. And they, they range from you know, very typical things like just uh, improving processes around switching off uh, equipment, uh, to developing a more advanced metering uh, solution. Um, this last one you may read here is just improving the insulation 
on their um, uh, pipework around the, the refrigeration and chill. So, um, typical, typical saving energy savings opportunities. And it's true for the for the food and drink sector that um, uh, it, it's a very, very high uh, consumer of energy overall. And when you look at where that energy is being used, um, just over 50% of it's um, in refrigeration. And the biggest obvious thing that any of our, our uh, uh, team of engineers at the Carbon Trust will look at is just making sure that plants aren't over cooling um, their chillers and just making sure that um, uh, other than that there's, there's a really good uh, maintenance regime in place. Maintenance of, of refrigeration equipment can't be emphasized strongly enough. It's absolutely essential. Um, beyond the sort of regular checks and, and maintaining that uh, equipment is operating efficiently, there's things such as looking at minimizing air changes in, in uh, refrigeration units as well. All areas where you can um, create some, some good uh, energy savings and effectively cost savings. So, an uh, example here is, is minimizing the air changes on a, on a chiller unit, um, a refrigeration unit, so that you're putting in um, uh, curtains there to reduce the loss of, of uh, cold air when you open up the doors. Um, then looking at optimizing the evaporator performance, making sure that um, uh, it's routinely defrosted uh, and so that the, the unit is having to work uh, uh, to consume too much energy. The last area in um, this, this aspect is looking at the condensers as well. So the condensers effectively where that waste heat is expelled and making sure that condensers are clean uh, and dust free and, and that effectively they have a, a clean flow of air. Uh, so that um, they can operate efficiently as well. So it's, again, much of the uh, easy uh, aspects of, of uh, addressing energy efficiency can be um, can be identified through uh, trained uh, energy consultants uh, coming to, to review uh, the way that you operate your sites and to make some clear recommendations. So another example here is um, within Ireland, uh, Glambia uh, ingredients International, they, they uh, have taken a lot of, of work to, to measure uh, the impact um, of their own sites. They, they just took some work to, uh, to deliver energy efficiency solutions at their sites. Indeed, they, they won the Carbon Trust Award uh, for reducing, making reductions at their sites. Um, and they also then took the next step to move on from there uh, to also look at um, waste and water at their sites as well. Um, and they've achieved uh, the Carbon Trust Standard, um, which is effectively uh, awarded to those organizations that have proven that they've measured their environmental impacts, and that they're managing those effectively, and that they can actually prove a reduction. So it's a mark of recognition for organizations that are going through that consistent cycle of, of measuring, managing, and consistently reducing their impacts, whether it be carbon, water, or waste. Um, so that was operational impact. So moving upstream, up the value chain, looking at suppliers. Um, Organisation you'll no doubt be well aware of, Board Beer, the Irish Food Board, um, have done a lot of work to to look at how how can um, farmers be provided with clear and simple information um, so that they can understand how to improve performance of their farms and reduce the environmental impact. So. They, they started from first principle that they, they are already going to farm because they operate the quality assurance uh, scheme in Ireland. Um, so they're already collecting an amount of data around key performance metrics at that farm. Uh, and they also want to look at uh, another and other uh, sustainability metrics. So they're collecting data from just over 90,000 farms in Ireland now. Uh, and that data helps them to provide very simple advice to farmers, such as things like improving uh, the grazing length uh, in, in, in for cattle and uh, for beef and, and dairy production, um, through to looking at manure management, looking at uh, nitrogen fertilizer per hectare applied, and all of that basically can get cons convert back into a report to the farmer to benchmark their performance against their neighbour's performance effectively. So all the other farms that are performing in this pool. And that, that's really the crucial thing, is actually providing simple, um, clear information about what clear actions um, farmers can do that's going to provide a, a financial benefit and an environmental benefit at the same time. So um, the tech doing a lot of work in that respect. And um, a couple of other examples here, just case studies of, of a couple of farms and their annual report that they've highlighted where they've made improvements. But the bigger, bigger picture here 
And when you look at the total um, distribution of the farms, this is the, uh, uh, the more efficient farm, this is the, the farm of perhaps with a higher carbon footprint. If you just look at focusing on the, on the worst performing farms and shifting them to the average performance, that's over a, a million tons of CO2 saving there. So collectively, that's a huge impact in terms of uh, greenhouse gas uh, savings. So um, that's uh, the data collection, the analysis of data. ABP um, have done something similar here, so they've engaged their supply chain to collect data, um, and they've proven that they are engaging pr uh, efficiently, and they've achieved the carbon trust standard uh, for supply chain as well. Um, and here is, here's an organization uh, which uh, moving downstream, so now they're, they're focusing on customer communications here. Um, Callista, they, they produce uh, fish feed, uh, innovative type of fish feed. They produce fish feed from methane. And so through a fermenting process, they create a protein um, from the, the methane. Uh, the, the bacteria will basically eat, eat the uh, methane through this fermentation process. They produce a protein. Um, and for them, the, the clear thing is, is that they want to be able to differentiate their products versus conventional fish feed. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, a lot of farm fish will be, the biggest impact is, is on, on uh, crops uh, being fed, so the fish feed going to the crops, um, uh, sorry, the crops going to the fish feed, um, and that uh, has a reliance on things like soya, which has a, has a high global warming potential due to issues such as land use change, but also there's other issues, sustainability issues, such as uh, fish meal that's used in, in uh, fish feed, and, and issues around scarcity of fish stocks and so on. So, so from their perspective, they're looking to understand from a life cycle perspective, how can they differentiate their product against conventional products and prove that their products are more sustainable. So again, they've done a lot of work um, quantifying value chain data to prove that point. Um, finally, the point here is around um, looking at uh, consumers. So uh, this point was raised at the end of the previous uh, seminar on how do you, how do you change behaviors? Um, it's essential, really, that consumers do change behaviours when you look at the, the big macro trends within the world today uh, and the consumption of, of beef and dairy. Um, and here, here's a report that we did with an organisation um, looking at uh, the importance of protein diversity. So uh, shifting uh, people's reliance on particular types of proteins to a broader diversity base uh, of protein which has both uh, an environmental, but a health and also a cost perspective as well. So perhaps another theme coming out there and a lot of... Uh, uh, um, uh, companies that provide um, food services to uh, public sector organisations, such as hospitals and schools, etc., are actually beginning to use this form of analysis in order to prove that they can sell meals that are more sustainable. Um, so again, a lot of uh, analysis there taking place. So, so to sum up, and a whistle stop to her and Valley Chain, um, the um, the underlying message here, which we won't be able to read, but in the centre here, you've got Valley Chain data enables better decisions. Um, effectively, what I mean by that is it enables you to get a better picture of your products, um, both the environmental impact of your products. It enables you to, uh, by having that better picture of your environment of your products, it enables you to engage product development, uh, your R&D teams, enables you to engage your operations about how you can create those products more efficiently. It enables you to look at uh, perhaps setting uh, a corporate target. So a lot of companies are increasingly coming under scrutiny uh, uh, around transparency of their actions around climate change, around water issues and so on, and they're committing to reduction targets. So again, having clear data around what is feasible in terms of reductions enables you to do that. So um, also data here enables you to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the last uh, example with the fish feed, enables you to differentiate your products against conventional um, uh, options. Um, it improves your, your brand um, by, by proving that you, you've measured your value chain, that you're addressing the most material impacts of seven commitments, um, and that you're, you're making those commitments and communicating those and improving your, the trust that your customers would have in your brand and your organization's ability to manage things responsibly. Um, and finally, most, perhaps the most important point for the food and drink sector, given that the majority of the impacts are going to be taking place is this aspect of, of supply chain and the importance of supply chain engagement, understanding where the impacts lie in terms of raw material use and, and being able to develop uh, appropriate strategies to deal with that. So all of that really sort of sums up the importance of, of measurement uh, as a starting point. Uh, and I hope that's been of help. It's been a really quick thing to try and fit in in 15 minutes. But uh, if you've got time for questions, I'll answer you. I'm happy to, to stick around for a bit after this as well. Thank you very much.